from LEX 18 News with in-depth coverage of the issues that challenge Kentucky. This is State of the Commonwealth with your host, Conroy Delouche. Good morning and welcome to State of the Commonwealth. I'm Conroy Delouche. Today marks nine days until Election Day, but millions of Americans have already voted. This election season has been different in many ways, recently shaped by the COVID-19 pandemic and social unrest across the country. According to the Pew Research Center, back in April, more than 90% of U.S. adults were following news about the coronavirus pandemic. And at that time, less than 60% were following the news about presidential candidates. Since then, the two themes have intertwined. And now about 79% of U.S. adults are following news about COVID-19, whereas 75% are following news about the presidential candidates. This week, we're looking at how the events of 2020 have shaped this election season. We begin by going back to March 6, 2020, the day the first coronavirus case was, was diagnosed here in Kentucky. It was reported out of Harrison County. Now, every county in Kentucky has been impacted since, but Harrison County was the first to experience life in a new normal. This week, I returned to Cynthiana to see how things have changed. Autumn in the bluegrass. We are the, the small town escape for your soul. A sight to behold as the leaves change across horse country. Less than 45 minutes from the heart of downtown Lexington. We have had visitors from all over Kentucky, people just getting in their car and traveling to small towns. Lies Cynthiana, a close knit community of less than 10,000. The inspiration for the Walking Dead comic, the hometown of Coach Joe B. Hall, and the first place COVID-19 was detected in Kentucky. They have been at the table working hand in hand with us and providing every detail that we have needed. Standing by Governor Andy Bashir in those first briefings was Wetco District Health Department Director Dr. Crystal Miller. They were scared, um, very much um, unsure of what this was going to look like. Harrison County Schools immediately shut down, businesses closed up, and restaurants had to quickly restructure. Okay. So our delivery and takeout sales have went from last year at this time from 5 to 7 percent up to 28 to 32 percent. Right now about 67 percent of my business is curbside and takeout and last year at this time it was 25 percent. There were many questions at the time so Carrie Rydell made the decision to temporarily close up Burley Market and Cafe for a few weeks to find some answers. How can we help our customers? How can we still pay our bills? And it was really the smartest thing to do. The cafe did bounce back from the shutdown along with other dining rooms and businesses along Cynthiana's downtown streets. We really weren't worried about losing businesses because our community support is, is so close knit. Uh, we all support each other and it was almost like we gravitated together to see how we could all get through this together. So this is where it all started and where it all happens. Inside the health department, and you're contact tracers are working 12 hour days, six days a week. They make contact with the positive case. They um, roll their life back 14 days and then they make contact with where they've been. Right now, Dr. Miller says she's especially working with Harrison County Schools on internal contact tracing as students return to the classroom. So when we get positives in the school, whether it's a student or a staff member, that school system works directly with us on contact tracing. So we're making sure all protocols are being met internally. Eastside Elementary recently welcomed students back inside the building. Can you pat? For the first time in more than seven months. To have students in our building feels amazing. Um, they want to be here. They're complying with everything we ask them to. And so they are enjoying being back as well. So we're just blessed to have them back. Principal Melissa Miles says the school released a detailed plan upon return. What the restroom breaks look like, what lunch looks like, what car dismissal looks like. And showed us the evidence through the halls and classrooms that encourage social distancing and mask compliance, signs that they are taking the risk of returning seriously. <laughs> Shuffling back to downtown Cynthiana where the kitchen at Bianchi's restaurant is bustling, even if the customers are not always inside. We're actually seeing a, a little bit of a uptick in, in uh, customers coming out. The business dates back to the late 1800s, and the owner says that they're continuing to evolve with the times. We wipe all the menus, we put them in different locations, wipe them before we put them back at the tables. We sanitize all the tables. It's sort of become a normal practice now, and that kind of thing, honestly, will probably stay forever, even after the pandemic's over. For the town that experienced the new normal first in Kentucky, the end of the pandemic can feel far away, but Carrie Rydell cannot wait to see Cynthiana's future from her restaurant window. This is my little corner of happiness. I love Cynthiana. My staff loves Cynthiana. Um, we just want to see everybody through this really hard time so that we have really good stories to tell later on. 
Now for the first two and a half months of the pandemic, the streets of downtown Lexington were quiet as most businesses were closed and people stayed home due to the shutdown. That all changed the week that George Floyd was killed in police custody in Minneapolis, which was captured on video, igniting protests and social unrest across the country. Alex 18's Catherine Collins and Mike Valenti covered weeks of protests here in downtown Lexington. They take us on a walk through the places that have been pivotal to the movement and tell us what it means at the ballot box this November. It's right here outside the courthouse on the corner of South Limestone and Main Street that protesters met here in downtown Lexington night after night following the deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. That's right, and while crowd sizes could vary, there were multiple nights when this square was filled with hundreds of protesters right before they marched for miles downtown. And those protests remain almost entirely nonviolent, although there were a handful of arrests, mostly because people were standing in the street. But from the beginning, protesters here have been focused on issues both locally and nationally, calling for change right here in Lexington. And as demonstrators across the country were taking to the streets to protest police brutality, activists here in Lexington were ramping up their organizing efforts. It's not just protest for the sake of protest, that it's not just about Breonna Taylor, that it's not just about George Floyd, that we do actually have local demands that will help keep black and indigenous people of color here in Lexington safer. A group called LPD Accountability revealed a list of demands for the Lexington Police Department, including a call for a citizens review board for police officers accused of misconduct and the end to the use of no knock warrants. And those demands came as congressional leaders in DC we're feeling the pressure to pass a comprehensive police reform bill. Meanwhile, the Democratic Senate primary here in Kentucky was heating up, and progressive challenger and state representative Charles Booker became a familiar sight on the ground at protests in Louisville. There is nothing we can't do. And as he chanted with protesters, he began gaining traction amongst voters. We are not going to miss this moment. This is our time. This is our time. After Amy McGrath defeated Booker in the primary in late June, he threw his support behind her in the race against Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. But Booker and a select few progressive state representatives have continued to focus their energy on the fight against systemic racism. This is my calling. This is the work that I was built to do. For State Representative Attica Scott, much of that fight has been focused on calling for justice for Breonna Taylor. Scott has been a mainstay at Louisville's now over 150 days of demonstrations, where at times tensions with police have been high. Despite all of the arrests that have happened from city to city of people who've been standing up for justice, folks are still coming out in even larger numbers, and it's happening all around the world. But she's also been calling for change in policing in Kentucky and around the country pushing to pass Brianna's law to ban no-knock warrants statewide. And one sign of progress, she says, is that other states have started to follow suit, pre-filing similar legislation. She continues to encourage activists and anyone who cares about the Black Lives Matter movement to vote this November. We all know who's been there for us and who hasn't been there for us. So I don't say to people how to vote um, for you know one candidate or the other, but I do say Please vote. Because she says representation is the key to systemic change. And Scott wants to see these young people run for office themselves in the coming years. I would be the first black woman in almost two decades to serve in our state legislature and the only one right now currently serving in our state legislature if people hadn't turned out to vote for me. So it's important that we support the people that we know are going to fight for and with us in local, state, and federal office. And we have to elect them in order for that to happen. Scott will be the first to tell you that the fight for change within our institutions cannot end after Election Day. But since protests began in late May, protesters have gained some small victories. Yeah, and that brings us here to the place formerly known as Cheapside Park, where black men, women, and children were sold as property for decades. You'll remember over the summer, protesters came here chanting, take back Cheapside, as people at bars sat looking on. And that movement gained traction when over the summer, the city decided to rename Cheapside to Henry Tandy Centennial Park. Now he's a prominent Lexingtonian who helped to build the old courthouse. Protesters have made it clear this is a sign of progress, 
But it's not enough. They want more than just symbolic change. For State of the Commonwealth, I'm Mike Valenti. And I'm Katherine Collins. Coming up, many people diagnosed with COVID-19 can be asymptomatic, but for others, the effects can be long lasting. That's next on State of the Commonwealth. We are more than seven months into the pandemic, and chances are you know someone who has been impacted by or even infected with the virus. As of Thursday's update, 1,380 Kentuckians have died after being diagnosed with COVID-19. More than 92,000 have tested positive since March 6th. Now, many of those diagnosed are either asymptomatic or have light symptoms and quickly recover. However, every day we learn more about those still battling the virus, some much longer than 14 days. Last week, we brought you the story of Stephen Woodson, the head coach of Washington County High School's basketball team. When first infected, he felt chills, then sweats, and after he tested positive, his symptoms progressed to shortness of breath. He's been in and out of the hospital four times this month, staying as long as four days during one of those visits. When we spoke with him this past Monday, he said he was feeling better. His message, don't be ashamed of your diagnosis, wear a mask, and help with contact tracing. Now we move from Washington County over to the Kentucky-Virginia border in Letcher County. That's where we found Amy and Donnie Sexton. They say sometime after returning home from Lexington, where he was undergoing cancer treatment, the couple began experiencing symptoms of COVID-19. They did test positive at the end of March, and Amy says that she missed several weeks of work as they recovered and quarantined. But more than six months later, they still feel effects of the virus. To this day, we still have sort of cycling symptoms, of shortness of breath, intense headaches, um, a lot of stomach issues, uh, some, still some dizziness, congestion, coughing, things like that. And so eyes burning. eyes burning and watering. <clears throat> My husband still has problems with really extreme fatigue and drowsiness, and we're not sure if that's a complication from the cancer treatment or if that's a COVID-19 long-term symptom or if it's both. We move now from Letcher County in Eastern Kentucky all the way back here to Lexington. Now you may remember seeing this video circulating on social media back in the spring. This is Sheila Thornsberry as she walked out of Baptist Health after battling COVID-19 for almost a month, including time on a ventilator. So after I came off the ventilator, I cried every day. And it was, when am I going to get to go home? When am I going to get to see my kids? And I was told by the physician that one, I had to walk to get out of there. He wasn't letting me go unless I walked out of there. So I had the physical therapist come twice a day. It's like, you're, you're going to get me walking. We're going to do this. And then the only way I would get to see my kids is if I had two negative tests before I left the hospital. And I did. I couldn't get to the end of that red carpet fast enough. My physical therapist, you can't, I mean, no one could see her telling me, but the whole time she's going, you got to slow down. <laughs> you got to slow down. You're going to fall. You know, I know you want to go fast, but you got to slow down a little bit. And we Just, were wondering how slow you were going to go because it seemed like you were moving in slow motion. Yeah, it, it was pretty emotional for me. Six months later, Sheila is doing much better after a lengthy recovery. She recently returned to work, no longer requires oxygen at night, and is able to enjoy walks with her husband. But even though the virus has passed, there are still lingering effects of COVID-19. I lost pretty much all the muscle mass in my legs. So, yeah, so that's, where, you know, coming home on the walker and the therapy is coming, you know, definitely helped a lot. And uh, the walking, like we try to do of an evening, but... Like you said, on days like today, got 10 minutes away from home and I couldn't breathe and my heart was racing and we came back. Most patients do recover from COVID-19, but almost every night since mid-March, the Capitol is lit green for those who do not. Nearly 1,400 Kentuckians have died after contracting the virus, and in seven months, we've learned some of their stories and the lasting impact on their loved ones. We recently spent time with Keith Taylor a Berea-based sports writer and newspaper publisher who lost his mother to COVID-19 this month. 68-year-old Donna Reed was hospitalized twice after her diagnosis in March, the second time for more than one month. No visitors were allowed during that time, and family members say she fought the battle alone, ultimately passing on October 5th. Earlier this week, Taylor penned a column titled, Trying to Make Sense of Living Nightmare. It begins, quote, the past two weeks have been a blur, and it feels like I've been living a bad dream. As badly as I wish, I just got out of bed, 
That's simply not true. The longest two weeks of my life have indeed been a reality after my mom lost her battle to COVID-19. Mom spent at least five weeks trying to fend off the virus and put up a courageous fight until the very end. That was mom's character and it was no surprise she kept battling and fighting. She even tried to pull out the ventilator hose that assisted her with breathing at one point while sedated. Before our family was hit with the virus, I knew COVID was cruel, but you don't know how vicious it can be until someone you love, the one who brought you into this world, is attacked to the point of no return, end quote. We'll be right back. The pandemic has changed nearly everything this election cycle, from the way candidates campaign to how people are even voting. We brought in Matt Irwin, Democratic strategist, and Trey Watson, former communications director for the Kentucky Republican Party, to discuss. It's affected how we uh, uh, campaigns are going out and reaching voters because it takes a lot of things off the table. And something has to fill that vacuum, whether it's uh, campaigning virtually and through text messages or holding teletown halls. I mean, really, I think campaigns are looking for any port in a storm to make up for the, the fact that you can't have a traditional field game in an atmosphere like this. I think definitely campaigning, it uh, especially hampers, I think, uh, challengers because the, tr the traditional tools that you would have were an incumbent, you're starting off at an, in an aim ID gap usually against an incumbent. The tools that you would have going out uh, as a candidate, meeting people, knocking doors, going to forums, parades, uh, all these are the places where you would get your name out and, and get your face in front of people. You, those are simply unavailable to you right now. As for the politics, I think that it's really uh, pretty stark how elected officials of the two different parties have approached this. I mean, you have, in, in, and this is my opinion, you have elected uh, officials, Democrats like our Governor Andy Bashir, who've taken measured steps and who's addressed this thing through science-based and data-driven activities. And then you have other, let's just use governors, other governors like Ron DeSantis in Florida, who've been saying, you know, have at it, world. Like, what, it, whatever happens with the virus happens. I, I think that politically, I think it's probably uh, crystallized partisanship even more so than, than we have been because Republicans think Republican governors have done good job. Democrats think Democrat governors have done good, a good job. And so I think it's, if anything, it's, it's crystallized a lot of uh, partisan divide that, that existed on the wings. And then you kind of left with, with, with a shrinking center who's kind of stuck in the middle trying to, to, trying to decide which way to go. Both strategists also discuss the number of options that Kentucky voters have to cast their ballots in a pandemic. I think that people should be pretty proud of their leadership in Frankfurt and how they've managed to build what I think is, is, is a fair and engaging system for voters during this pandemic. I think a lot of states have dropped the ball either through incompetence, incompetence or partisanship. And I think um, our governor and our secretary of state uh, and our county clerks deserve a lot of credit for creating a system that, uh, at least here in Kentucky, lets people know that their vote will count. I agree with with Matt as far as uh, how the election is going to run. I think uh, you know we've got a good system in place. I don't necessarily uh, like everything as I've made vocally clear. I don't necessarily like everything that we've got in place as far as a, a permanent structure. But you know you've got to make exceptions for for the extraordinary times that we're in. And I think people can can feel safe in, in their votes being counted and, and, and the election results being true here. Of course, those voting changes were caused by the pandemic, but did COVID-19 also influence who people voted for? As people voted early in person, LX18's Kristen Edwards visited a couple of polling sites in Lexington to find out. A couple hundred thousand Kentuckians have made up their minds. They've already made the trip to the mailbox or the ballot box where signs of the pandemic are in plain view. Everyone in masks and social distancing here at the Lexington Library, Tate's Creek Branch. But was COVID-19 on voters' minds inside the voting booth? After voters cast their ballots, we wanted to know if the coronavirus affected their choices. So we posed this question. Did COVID-19 influence your vote? Um, then voters walked up to the mic to speak their minds. I think the question is, did COVID-19 influence my vote? Some said it had no effect. It absolutely did not. I don't think uh, it's as important as everybody's making it out to be. COVID-19 did not influence my vote. While others said the virus was top of mind. COVID-19 has 100% affected the way that I vote because 
you know, this year has just been a very crazy year. And I think it's so important to um, vote for the right people to take care of this global pandemic that we're still in. And we need people in power that are going to take it seriously and really take care of it. We also took our poster board question down the road to another polling site, Wellington Elementary. There, I'm not ready yet. I'm thinking about it. We found voters were also divided on their answers. I don't think COVID-19 really affected my vote, even though it has made the world crazy. My vote is more about I don't like big government. And so, um, yeah, COVID is not really a factor in my vote today. Did COVID-19 influence my vote? No, I don't think so. Certainly. In what way? Um, just really makes you think about um, especially working in healthcare, it really makes you think about how serious people are actually taking this. Whether voters cast their ballots with the pandemic in mind or not, they will decide who will lead them through it in the future. For State of the Commonwealth, I'm Kristen Edwards. Thank you for joining us. We have more on today's topic online. You can just head over to lex18.com and click on State of the Commonwealth. We'll see you next Sunday.